As I reflect on the story of resurrection celebrated in countless churches this day, the story that emerges out of the death of hopes and dreams, the story of how life can win even when it seems most unlikely, as I reflect on the resurrection that is real for all people, Christian or not, I recall the words of the poet T.S. Eliot. He wrote, what we call a beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. The end is where we start from. I have three stories to share with you this morning. Three stories of endings leading to beginnings. Three stories of life winning, despite loss, despite death. Three stories in which the narrative seemed to be over before it was. Three stories of resurrections that can remind us that just as the Easter story has revealed to us in myth and metaphor, just as the seasonal transition from winter to spring has revealed to us throughout our Midwestern lives, just as our own experiences of this wild and precious and unpredictable life have revealed to us again and again, it's not over till it's over, and then it's not over. The first story comes from the history of this church, as told by member Oval Quist many years ago. The story begins in 1891, when Charles T. Mason, a successful clothing merchant, and his young wife settled in Boone, Iowa. The newlyweds looked with joy to the birth of their first child. The expectant mother spent many hours sewing delicate clothes for their baby, a baby who tragically did not live to wear them. A year later, the young wife was again expecting, but this time the result was even more devastating. Neither the baby nor the mother survived. The husband, now brokenhearted and alone, packed the tiny garments that represented the couple's hopes and dreams, and now his despair, into a child's toy trunk, wrapped it with heavy paper, and stored it in the attic of the home they had shared. The story, as recorded, does not tell us how the years that followed treated Charles Mason, nor how he navigated these significant losses. We can imagine his sorrow weighing heavily on him, we can imagine him having to listen to what his life intended to do with him now that the narrative he thought he was living had been changed. And we can imagine those baby clothes left unworn, packed away in his attic in a trunk gathering dust, representing what seemed to be the end of the story of young love and high hopes. There is no mention that Charles Mason had any connection with our church, at least not yet. Meanwhile, members of this congregation were contributing in their own faith and action through the Unitarian Service Committee to World War II relief efforts. They helped collect enough canned goods to fill two railway cars and nearly two tons of clothes to be shipped to the East Coast and forwarded to Europe. The women of this congregation were especially tireless, earning the attention of the local press and radio for their work in preparing nearly 8,000 World War I overcoats to be sent overseas. Before shipping the coats to Europe, coats that had been donated by the army base at Fort Des Moines, the women had to remove the army insignia buttons and replace them with plain buttons, donated for the cause from people throughout the US. These diligent women were living their faith and helping people miles away, but their story was not quite over yet either. Following Charles Mason's death in 1946, his niece discovered the trunk and the tiny baby clothes that had been stowed away for more than 50 years. Inspired by the work of the Des Moines Unitarians, she brought the heirloom trunk and its precious contents to Des Moines and left them at the church with a note explaining, perhaps the clothes will be of some help to a baby in Europe. Women experienced in needlework who viewed the baby clothes described the craftsmanship as some of the finest they had ever seen, so fine that the clothes were put on display for a time at the baby department at Yonkers. Before long, the hopes of the niece were realized and the clothes were sent by this church to Europe, where they would be part of another story yet unfolding, the story of an unknown family who would benefit from the careful handiwork of a loving mother. There could be no denying the losses the Mason family endured, 
The reemergence of the clothes more than 50 years following their creation did not change the fact that terrible loss had occurred. And it is difficult to see how the lived facts of these losses are friendly. Still, the story of the Masons continued even beyond their deaths, intersecting with the compassionate care of a congregation and touching the lives of a family an ocean away. The story of the Mason family, even in the bleakest of times, even after their deaths, you see, wasn't over yet. I see this as an Easter story because it asks us how might the deaths we have endured become a legacy beyond our own lives? How might our stories continue after we are gone? And how might we continue the stories that have been bequeathed to us? The second story is also a story of responding to death and to war with surprising beauty, with compassion, with unexpected life. This story begins in Sarajevo on May 27, 1992. The city had been under siege for weeks, filled with shelling and sniper fire as it had become a battlefield of the Bosnian War. For the city's citizens caught in the crossfire, finding food and water had become a daily ordeal. On this morning in May, a long line of people had gathered at one of the city's still functioning bakeries when a mortar shell was fired upon them. 22 people were dead as a result of the blast, with many more injured, creating a horrific display of rubble and body parts. Vedran Smajlovic, a professional cellist with the Sarajevo Opera, lived near the bakery and came to the aid of his fellow citizens, feeling helpless and appalled as he took in the scene. Smajlovic returned to his apartment. What must he have been feeling as the sounds of war continued around him? The scenes of destruction and human suffering fresh in his mind. He dressed in his performance attire of black tuxedo tails and a white shirt. He grabbed his cello and a stool and he came back to the site of the bombing. He sat down and began to pull the bow across the strings of his instrument in the midst of the rubble. People gathered to hear his music despite the dangers, for the cellist was offering them life in the midst of death, life that they desperately needed to hear. Svijlovic returned to play at the site for the next 22 days in honor of each person who had died. Sniper fire continued and mortars still fell, yet he continued to play. He went to other sites where the lives of his fellow citizens had been taken, he played at funerals without charge, even though the Serbian gunners would target these gatherings. His music became a balm of beauty, a gift to those who needed courage to face another day amidst the ever-present gunfire and shelling. He became a symbol of peace and resilience in the midst of war and death. A reporter asked him whether he was crazy to play his cello in the midst of war. He responded, you ask me, am I crazy for playing the cello? Why do you not ask if they are not crazy for shelling Sarajevo? Smajlovic's courage and persistence in sharing his music is an Easter story, a story of life in the midst of death, a story of life wins. What gifts might we offer when things around us are falling apart? How might our talents become a blessing to others? How might our offerings reveal the truth that we are, in fact, connected connected by shared air, shared beauty, and one shared breath. The final story I will share today is also a story of resilience in the midst of suffering, of beauty arriving in the bleakest of places, a story of life not over yet. It's the story of Jarvis Masters. Jarvis, a baby born in 1962 to a drug-addicted mother and a fatherless home. 
Jarvis, a child who by the age of five had experienced violence and volatility beyond what most of us experience in a lifetime. Jarvis spent his youth bouncing from foster homes to homes for dependent children to poverty-stricken housing projects. By the time he was 12, he was a ward of the court. At the age of 17, an angry young man conditioned by the instability of his upbringing, he was released from the California Youth Authority and went on a crime spree, holding up stores and restaurants until he was captured and sent to San Quentin Prison at the age of 19. While at San Quentin, gang life in the prison offered him an experience of family and belonging. In 1985, an officer in the prison was killed and members of Jarvis's gang were deemed to be responsible. Though Jarvis was locked in his cell at the time of the murder, he was one of three inmates who were tried for the officer's death. His accused crime was sharpening a piece of metal that was allegedly passed along and used to stab the officer. Jarvis was the only one of the three who received the death penalty. Since 1990, Jarvis has remained on death row at San Quentin, locked in the scene of his accused crime, daily facing prison employees who have had motivation to treat him harshly. As a member of his defense team has written, Jarvis has had more opportunity than most people on this earth to face up to how people feel about him. Despite all the suffering he has endured and the mistakes that he has made, Jarvis has discovered within the bleak realities of his life a vista to the value of the present moment that may elude many of us. Informed by his devotion to his Buddhist meditation practice and an honest reckoning with the details of the life that brought him to death row, he began writing essays that have become two published books read by thousands and praised for their wisdom by people like Desmond Tutu Sister Helen Prejean, and Angela Davis. In his book, Finding Freedom, he writes, When I first got charged with murder, it seemed unreal to me. As other people started to do their job of finding a way to save my life, I joined the crusade. I have never cooperated before, but for the first time ever, I was determined to find out what was going on with me. I didn't want to justify the things I had done, and I wasn't cooperating now just to save my skin. Wanting to know the facts about myself made me take my life seriously for the first time. I had always lived with death, in the street, in prison, and I understood what leads people to prison, but I didn't understand Jarvis. Through his meditation practice, he began to understand. He says he has learned to slow down, not to run from the pain of his life, but to sit with it, confront it, give it the companion it had never had. He says he has realized that what really matters isn't where we are or what's going on around us, but what's in our hearts while it's happening. He writes, every effort I make to love means I don't have to feel hatred. When I'm compassionate, all my energy goes in a positive direction and there's no room for negativity. It is difficult, he says, to integrate his meditation practice with all the suffering he experiences and sees in San Quentin. He writes, I fail continuously. I know so little. I'm just hanging in there with my meditation. Practice, he says, is my best companion. And his practice and the writing it has inspired have made a significant difference in his life and in the lives of those around him. He says, they have enabled me to turn a situation as bad as mine into an opportunity to be of some benefit, to transcend my present circumstances, to transform everything around me into something almost radiant, filled with a chance to make a difference in my own life and in the world. When I read Jarvis's writings, I see that his is an Easter story. It's a story of discovering life amidst death. When I consider the kind of entombment he has endured from the challenges he has faced and is now 25 years on death row, how he has rolled away the stone of his past and emerged into a kind of freedom even as he remains physically behind bars, I see the difficulties of my own life differently. I see that many of my struggles would be seen as blessings to others. I see that my life, indeed all of our lives, offer opportunities for us to become enlightened if we can choose to compassionately relate to the stories of our past, 
open ourselves to the present and discover that despite what we may have been told or told ourselves, our stories are not over yet. Where in your life could you see the ending you have taken for granted as a place of beginning? Where might you discover your own Easter story by rolling away the stone of what has been so that you can embrace what yet can be? This Easter and all the days to follow, may we find in our stories the possibility of grace and redemption. May we offer in the midst of despair the music that is uniquely ours to share. And may we discover the possibilities of new beginnings, even in the midst of very real endings, so that we may find, at last, we may find the old wounds, the old misdirections, and lift them one by one close to our hearts and say, holy, holy, holy indeed. For hallelujah, our story is not over yet.